اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول حي على الصلاة الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم ربي يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم صدق الله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين أما بعد الحمد لله All praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be here today to perform the Salat al-Jum'ah the Friday congregational prayer and to listen to the khutbah inshallah Alhamdulillah, all praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing us to belong to the Ummah, for choosing us to belong to the followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we pray and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in and upon his family members and blessed companions inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his hidayah, his guidance upon us, to shower his forgiveness upon us, and to shower his acceptance upon us. I once more ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me, by giving me the permission and the ability to be able to deliver this khutbah, inshallah, I remind myself and I remind you as always that we are human beings, we are weak and we know nothing. And it is only by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we are able to say or do anything. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability to be able to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. Last week, alhamdulillah, we continued on the topic of kind words and how we should relate to people, how we should speak, and how we should be very, very conscious of what we say and how we speak to people. And those of you who are not here and those of us who are here, we reminded ourselves that after Ramadan, after fasting, after her giving zakat, and salah, etc., it is important that we know how to deal with people, how to talk to people. Because the Prophet ﷺ had warned us severely about the tongue, how we can lose blessings by abuse of the tongue, the way we speak to people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 263, that we should not give charity, help people, do things for them, and then insult them after. Or because we give people sadaqah and charity, we use that liberty to abuse and insult people. Allah says, it's better you don't give them any charity if you have to insult them and abuse them. And then the Prophet ﷺ reminded us in so many different ways. And we reminded ourselves of the hadith last week in which the Prophet ﷺ said, if you, if we, and he told the people, he told them at that time, that if you would guarantee me to safeguard what is between your two jaws, and what is between your two legs? The Prophet ﷺ said, I will guarantee you paradise. And we went down last week, bi'ithnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind ourselves again. And in fact, the topic of the CD or the DVD that you can get after the khutbah today of last week was, safeguard what is between the two jaws and the two legs. Because... We went down to remind ourselves that people who have no fear for Allah and who don't obey the commands of the Quran and the Sunnah, they don't care. They commit adultery, fornication, all sorts of things outside. They have no fear about breaking the laws of the Quran. And that's abuse of what is between the two legs. People who have no iman and no faith in Islam and Allah, Men, rather than marrying four wives, they marry one wife and have 40 women outside. Do you know what the Hadith says about that? On the day of judgment, when people go to hell after that, those people who have had a relationship with women that are not their wives, you know, the macho men, money men style, 
You have money, you have one wife for society, and you have 40 women committing sin. They will be eating raw, rotten meat. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, the, the punishment of backbiting. The Prophet ﷺ said when he went on Miraj and he saw Jahannam, the people, there were a group of people who were scratching their faces, disfiguring their faces, disfiguring their faces. And suddenly the face will come back again and they will scratch and disfigure their faces in the worst way. And the angel told the Prophet Sallallahu those were people who backbited people and slandered people. They tried to disfigure the character of people by the tongue. By what? By talking, backbiting, slandering. And they will be doing that to themselves in Jahannam. In addition to the nar and the fire and the punishment. Abuse of the thing between the two jaws. Get the khutbah, get a topic after Salah, inshallah. And the people who abuse what is between the two legs, they'll be eating raw, rotten meat. I know that's a big thing for people today. Everybody looking for halal meat. or well, some don't even care. They eat haram meat even here. So if you're accustomed to eating haram meat, you'll get it up there too. They'll be eating rotten, stink meat. And when the Prophet wasallam asked, what did those people do? They do what they were, those were the ones who had sexual relationship with people who were not halal for them. Men or women. That's why the Prophet wasallam said, if you promise me, the, guarantee me that you would safeguard what is between the two jaws and the two legs, I guarantee you Jannah, inshallah. Very severe issue. But we didn't go much into detail about the two legs. We were talking about the tongue, what is between the two jaws. Because those who don't practice Islam and have no fear for Allah and do not read the Quran or read the Quran and do not follow the laws of the Quran or, or the life and pattern of the Prophet wasallam, those who pray Salah, Juma, fasted, Hajj, Zakat, what's going to be their problem? Their problem, they will not probably be doing fornication and adultery but they will be having abuse of the tongue. Don't you see it in masjid? People pray salah, and as they go home, they start a quarrel. As they go outside in the parking lot, they start a quarrel. They're quarreling while they're praying salah. Some people quarreling while they're praying. They don't even know how to pull someone to the side of them to pray. They do it in such a harsh way. Ya Allah, They don't even know how to use a tongue. Come here. They speak in this hoggish animalistic way so all the salah and all the blessings so you see that hadith really handled the people who don't believe and worship Allah and have no fear for the laws of the Allah of Islam and it also hadith the, uh, the hadith also applies to those people who pray perform hajj and I told you last week bi'ithnillah those of you who have been to hajj people are performing hajj they're doing tawaf they're doing ibadah around the Kaaba, and they're quarreling. They're fighting. Haven't you seen bloodshed around the Kaaba? Those of you who have been to Hajj, have you seen that? If you didn't, I've seen it. People fighting to put their head to kiss the black stone. Literally blood, you see. Abuse, which is totally un-Islamic, nowhere in the Quran and Sunnah. It says you should fight to kiss the black stone. So in trying to perform a sunnah, because the Prophet wasallam kissed the stone, we are breaking a farce. Fighting, not even talking, fighting. See the danger? So, time does not permit, and I don't want to get back into that topic now, inshallah. But just to remind us, again, we started speaking on that issue, because after Ramadan, after we prayed and we did all this ibadah and read all this Quran and did all these things, it is important that we don't throw it away. Because when we abuse people by the tongue, when we insult people, when we slander, when we do gibber, when we do backbiting, our blessings that we earned in Ramadan, or the Juma that we pray, our thawab, 
blessings go to the people we have abused and insulted. And then on the day of Qiyamah, the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ said that we will rise bankrupt. Have a lot of Quran and, 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 and Salah and Zakat and fasting and Hajj in our books. Yeah, have a lot. But so many people we have abused and slandered and oppressed and insulted that when we, by doing all these things and hurting all these people, all our blessings will go to them and we'll stand under their judgment like, where all the tarawih I prayed in Ramadan? Where's all the zakat I gave? All the 10, 15 hajj I performed? It went to the people we bad talk and slandered. Abuse of the tongue. Very serious issue, brothers and sisters. I don't intend to continue on that topic. We dealt on that. But Iznillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the past two weeks. So you can get it on your DVDs and CDs after Salah, inshallah. Um, in the next khutbah, inshallah, in the second khutbah today, Bi'idhnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to touch on another little issue. I know Hajj is around the corner. Today is the 25th of Shawwal. You have Zil Qa'da, and then the next month is Zil Hajj. And the millions of people will be going to perform Hajj. So I want to remind myself and remind you of a very interesting lesson in the life of Prophet Ibrahim wasalam. In the life of Prophet Ibrahim wasalam, which is a very powerful link to Hajj, to Islam, to Muslims, to Jews, to Christians, to the entire world, inshallah. And you know today is a very interesting day. The United Nations are sitting, trying to come up with a decision for a separate state for Palestine. How does that link to Ibrahim Sometimes I wonder, should politicians make that decision? Or should the religious leaders make that decision? I don't know. Maybe if we read the Quran and the Bible and Torah, we will see the answer, inshallah. And that's what the world needs to know. But whatever good we do and whatever, whatever, whatever effort people make, mashallah, alhamdulillah. So in the second khutbah, inshallah, I want to remind myself and remind you as we get to this fifth pillar of Islam and some of the lessons that we have learned in the examples in the life of Prophet Ibrahim wasalam, We'll talk about that bi'idhnillah with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the second khutbah, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah, paradise without reckoning, inshallah. Wa akhir da'wan. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Teri shan ke ho laik Wo sana kaha se laun Teri shan ke ho laik वो सना कहां से लाऊं तुझे आए प्यार जिस पर वो निदा कहां से लाऊं वो निदा कहां से लाऊं तेरी शान के हो लायक वो सना कहां से लाऊं तुझे Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina man yahdihillahu falamadhillala wa man yudhillahu falahadiyala wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la wa nashhadu anna muhammadan a'dahu wa rasooluh Once more we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be gathered here today to perform the Salat al Jum'ah and to listen to the khutbah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in.
I once more ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his mercy, his guidance, his forgiveness, and his acceptance upon each and every one of us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again to shower his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to be able to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability to be able to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. In the Holy Quran, <clears throat> Surah Hashar, chapter 59 of the Holy Quran, ayah number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqullaha Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad wattaqullaha inna Allah khabirum bima ta'malu Allah says in this chapter, chapter 59, verse 18, that, O oh, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqullah, O oh, ye believers, do your duty to Allah. And then he says, Wal tanzur nafsu ma qaddamat ligad. And look forth for what you send for tomorrow. Inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amaloon. That certainly Allah is aware and is well updated with everything that is going on. Has knowledge of everything that we do. Very interesting. A very important point to note that Allah is telling us, meaning that we should do such a'mal, such deeds, such good deeds that will benefit us tomorrow. Gadan. Tomorrow. Tomorrow in this life. Tomorrow in the grave, do such deeds that will, if we plant now, we will reap it later on in life. If we do such good deeds, when we die, we will get the blessings of those deeds. It will be a means, the jannah, I mean, the, the, the qabr, the grave, will be like a jannah for us. You know, the hadith of the Prophet says, if a person lives a good life, obeys the laws of Allah, and does amilu salihat. When that person passes away and goes into the grave, the grave becomes spacious for that person. And the person enjoys the cool breeze as though he's already in Jannah, like a window opening in the grave for him. The grave, even the earth is happy in the coming of that person. And in hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, when a person lives a bad life in this world, his tomorrow in that grave, the first in transit or stop on the journey to the hereafter, Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala who reminded us of that, it's the first stop as we proceed to the day of Qiyamah. If a person lives a bad life and does not do amil al heart and good deeds, then the grave closes into that person. So much that the ribs of one side goes into the other, crushes the person, comes back out, goes again. It begins right here. So the Mufassirin and commentators of the Quran says, that is also part of understanding our tomorrow, that if we do the right deeds and the right things today, then the grave that we will go into in that next journey could mean literally today, if we do good deeds today, then when we get older, we will reap from those good deeds that we did when we were young. You see what I'm saying? You see, if you look at life, sometimes people go through some suffering when they go, get old, failing to realize it's because they did that when they were young. So they face it back. And you remember I was saying last week, that if a person slanders someone, accuses someone, 
abuse of the tongue, then before that person dies, that slander will fall back on them. They will face it in this world. So if we say the right thing, we will reap the right thing in this world. And we will also reap the right thing if we do good deeds in the grave. It will not be a beginning of punishment for us. Ligad for tomorrow. Ma'akaddamat ligad. Do what is good and will be beneficial for us tomorrow. Now, I don't want to get so much in details of this line, but I wanted to link the life of Prophet Ibrahim to this verse. Inshallah. Where if we look, and because in the next few weeks will be Hajj, great examples of the life of Prophet Ibrahim when the pilgrims go to Hajj. After Ramadan, the fifth pillar. The next few weeks, Hajj. People will see the Kaaba. Built by Ibrahim والسلام, and his son Ismail. And around the Kaaba, you see Maqama Ibrahim with the footprints inside. People will go to Mina. People will run Safa Marwa. All places and symbols of incidents in the life of Prophet Ibrahim. His wife Hagar and son Ismail. Very interested. That's why it's important for us sometimes to recall, reflect on the lessons we have learned from in the life of Prophet Ibrahim. What is the connection between him and this verse that I want to make, inshallah? His tomorrow. When Allah says to do and send forth good deeds for your tomorrow, this world and the next, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, subhanallah, his, him and his family, you see the examples of the deeds they have done for tomorrow. And I was telling you a little while, coincidentally and interesting enough, that again right now we are speaking and you have the United Nations sitting and trying to make a decision for Palestine to have their own state. Now, I ain't talking about that, because I'm not a politician and I don't want to get involved in that. Because I always say that's not a religious issue, it's a political issue. Because if it's a religious issue, then the religious leaders should make the decision. If it's a decision of the Torah, the Bible, the Psalms, and the Quran, then the people who best understand the Torah, the Bible, the Psalms, and the Quran should understand that. But you know, we love the little dunya and the politics and astakfrillah. Politics is such a sad thing. You know, if those of you who were here many, a few years ago, I always tell you that's how the world runs. Do things for Allah, not for people. You do things for Allah, and in pleasing God, you, do, you please the people. But don't please the people and displease God. Because as long as we please the people, we will please God automatically. And if you try to please the people and displease God, you'll have a problem. That's a serious issue. Because people are just people. And many a times, Satan twists the minds of people. A few years ago, everybody were worshipping President Obama. Now the same people are here worshipping, they don't even want to hear him. I said, what happened? You guys failing yourself? He's a good man. Let's be very honest. He's an honest man. He's a good man. So why you just give up on him? Because you didn't get what you want. See how human beings are ungrateful? What did he really do wrong? He just didn't do nothing for us. So that's why you hate him. So you didn't intentionally, godly voted for the man. You voted for yourself. We've got to understand when we do things for God, when we do things for man, and we do things for ourselves. Selfish. If we vote for the betterment of what is good for God and Islam, we'll get what is good for God and Islam. If you vote for what is for your pocket, <laughs> you might even lose what is in your pocket. But anyhow, I, again, as I said, I ain't no politician, so I don't want to talk about politics. I just like to show the link to Islam on it. That's why Islam will always be there. And I've always told you, I don't know if you know, I have been offered by prime ministers and presidents to get into politics. Personal, personal offer. Come and be the minister in my government. 
And I said, listen, they will change you after five years. I'm still here after 30 years, alhamdulillah. And they're like, wow. So when I meet those guys and say, how many times you change shift? If you stick to the profession of God, that's a lifetime. And if you stick to the profession of man and dunya, that's not a lifetime. The same people who want to bill you will sink you. As long as you let the intention right. I have no problem with politics, so don't, don't misunderstand me. But if the intention is wrong, we'll have wrong consequences. Innamal a'malu bin niyat, Allah says. The Prophet said. And he says this deen is deen of ikhlas. This religion of Islam is one of sincerity. So if we think we're Muslims and we don't have sincerity, we have a problem with Islam. Our Islam is not true. We are not practicing truly. Very important. This deen is about ikhlas and sincerity. And when we look in the life of Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wa salam, subhanallah, think about what he did for his tomorrow. And Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wa salam, when you look at him, the Jews call him the father of nations. The Christians call him the father of nations. We call him Ibrahim, the father of nations. Why? Why did he earn that title? Why did he earn the title of Khalilullah, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He didn't do what we do. He was, he was so devoted to Allah, so sincere, that he was willing to give up whatever he had for Allah. He was a man who couldn't have a child. For 83 years, he did not have a child. And he prayed and he prayed and he asked Allah for a child. And you go in the Bible, the Torah, the Psalms, they tell you the same thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worked out a plan and had his infrastructure and strategy for it to happen. How did it happen? On one case, you had Zakaria alayhi salatu wa salam. He wanted a child. He couldn't have children and his wife couldn't have children. And Allah said, Kun fayakun bi and it shall be. Directly, he made the woman who couldn't have a child have a child. And the man had passed the age who couldn't have a child had a child. And the child name was what? Yahya. In the Quran, Allah tells us. In English, we call him John the Baptist. The cousin of Jesus, peace be upon him. Directly. For Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, what did Allah do? Look at the strategy. Look, subhanallah. You see, that's why we got to learn the lessons in this. Allah calls Sarah, his wife, his first wife, to give Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam her maid who was Hagar. That was what? Her maid. It wasn't any girlfriend he picked up on the side of the street. It was her maid that was given to her as a gift. She loved her husband so much and she knew he wanted to have a child and he wanted to have children. And she knew she couldn't have children that she gave him her maid to marry to so he could have children. Now, a lot of people corrupt this story and tell you that he did it illegal and it was an illegal relationship, haram relationship, and the nine yards. That's why some people don't accept the child that was born from Hagar because they don't believe it was a legal relationship. So we got to get care be careful not to get confused when you read a lot of non-authentic things. She gave him the wife. Then some people go further to say, well, it's because she was jealous of Hagar when Hagar had the baby boy, Ismail, that she told Ish Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wa salam, to take that wife and child and get out from here. It wasn't even that. It was Allah who ordered him to do it. Because he didn't go by the commands of women. He went by the commands of Allah. See, today a lot of us go by the commands of women 
That's why you'll go in. I wouldn't say what happens. All I'll tell you, that's a sign of Kiyama. The Kiyama, the day of judgment, will not come, says the Prophet ﷺ, until men will begin to obey women. Are we in that time? I have a lawyer here. You probably do it a lot of cases. You think so? Maybe the lawyer said yes. Barrister law. I'm sure he deals with a lot of marriage cases. You face the consequences. If you worship woman, you will get woman consequences. You worship God, you will get God consequences. Very simple. But he didn't worship women. Nor did he go by their commands. He went by the commands of Allah. So when we hear what Sarah was jealous and Sarah told him to take the wife and child, it wasn't that. It was Allah who told him to do that. So point number one. He took, Allah commanded him after waiting so long to have a child. And when he had this baby boy who was called Ismail. And in the Bible and Torah and Psalms we say Ishmael. Allah then said, all right, now you had your child. I want you to take that child and his mother and take him and carry them away to Makkah. The deserted land, no water, no food, nothing. See the first sacrifice there now? So much love he had for Allah. He didn't do like us. Some of us would have said, huh? You see, a lot of us think that his first sacrifice was the slaughtering of Ishmael. No. That wasn't just the first sacrifice. He had to now separate from the wife and the child. Allah said, take them away. And you got to come back. He, because he loved Allah, he could have said, yeah, Allah, I live in Florida, you know. I got a lot of business. I need to have this one son to continue my business. Let me see if I'll have another son. I'll give you that one. Did he do that? He looked up his tomorrow. If Allah gave me this child, and Allah says I must devote this child and take this child to Makkah, a deserted land with no food, he didn't say, Allah, no food, no water, what's going to happen to my child? If Allah said so, his wife asked him. Hagar said, so what's up? Why are we going to do this? He said, because Allah said so. She said, if Allah said to take me and my child away, so be it. See the obedient wife? Do we have such obedient women today? Willing to go by the laws of Allah with the child? She had to sacrifice her husband and had to go through the sacrifice with her child because her husband was going to leave her and come back. She had nothing. But for the sake of Allah, she made the sacrifice and look at her tomorrow what it became. She was the mother of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. From whom came Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. She didn't look at the struggle and the sacrifice then. Look at what her tomorrow became. The mother of the largest ummah in the world. She could have decided to stay back. And look at the beauty of the woman. Sarah sacrificed her love and allowed him to have another wife so he could have a child for the pleasure of Allah. That was one sacrifice she made there. So because she made that sacrifice, now Allah would have had his plan. I'm just telling you what it did here. By her sacrifice, here what happened. We had Ismail born. You follow that? Because she sacrificed her love, her selfishness for the sake of Allah. So go ahead. So here came Ismail alayhi salatu salam, born from that gift that she gave. Today we all sit in comfortable calling ourselves Muslims. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, came from Ismail, came from Hagar. You've got to understand the history of Islam. And Hagar, when her son became that age, Allah commanded her to sacrifice the father, of course, Ibrahim salam, to sacrifice the son Ismail, and I'm cutting this long story short, because most of you know the story, sacrifice the son when he became that age of 12 or 13. She could have said, what was wrong with you? You told me the child was born, you made me leave Palestine, you made me bring the child over to this deserted land, no food, no water. 
Huh? Now the child has grown up to take care of me and take care of you and you want to kill the child? She said, if it's the command of Allah, then so be it. By her, by the sacrifice of the father, but let's look at the mother. It was also a sacrifice of the mother. A lot of times people forget the sacrifice of the woman here. The mother didn't stop the father. The mother did not question the father on his devotion for his dean and his son. Because she made the sacrifice and said if it's for the will of Allah and the pleasure of Allah, then go ahead. Sacrifice my only son. Your only son. Sarah made the sacrifice of giving him a wife. The child Ismail was born. Hagar made the sacrifice of allowing him to sacrifice her son. And what happened in return of that? On the other side, the child Isaac was born. The Mufassirin and commentators say that because of that great sacrifice of Hagar and, his, and Abraham والسلام, willing to sacrifice his one and only son Ismail والسلام, Allah then blessed Abraham with another child. So you see, one wife gave up for the next wife, and the next wife gave up for the next wife, and both of them prospered. And from these two wives came Ismail والسلام, and came Ishaq والسلام, who is called Ishmael and Isaac. And from them both you have the Muslims, and you have the Jews and Christians. And if I look at the world today, Palestine, Israel. And we look at the United Nations now trying to decide what we should do. That's what I said. That's a political situation. Because if people go back into the Quran, Muslims, and if Jews and Christians and politicians would go into the Bible, the Torah, and the Psalms, they would see, but these people are one family. And the same father was in charge of this land. And these Jews and Christians and Muslims came from these two women who had the same husband. What is all this split about? And I don't know whether there is separation at state or not. Don't, I'm not saying anything. But then sometimes I wonder. Whatever the politicians may do or do not do. That's why we must keep in line with Quran and the revelations of Allah. And it was also a reminder of Jewish and Christian people that they must keep in, in coordination with what God said in the scriptures. Because whatever will be, will be. And whatever may be the consequences, a lot of us blabber our mouths. But you know what's going to happen? Whether they have a separation or not, or whether they put up walls or not, when Jesus comes back, peace be upon him, and he brings these children of Hagar, Sarah, these people, offsprings of Hagar and Sarah, offsprings of Abraham or Abraham والسلام, and say that you people are people who belong to one ummah and your God is the same God, Allah. He will tear down the walls and bring them back together in their proper understanding of their life and their obedience to Allah, if we believe in Islam. Very interesting situation. But sometimes, as you know, politicians make a lot of money out of things, and it's all a lot of media coverage and all sort of nine yards. I don't want to get into, I'm speaking not about the politics, I'm speaking about the understanding. Every time I look at the clock, I see it sticking away, and time does not permit me. But I want to remind myself anew. That because of this sacrifice of Ibrahim والسلام, because of the sacrifice of these wives who were so sincere and devoted to Allah, Sarah and Hagar became the mothers of the leaders of the world, became the mothers of the wealthiest people in the world, became the mothers of the most powerful nations in the world. So powerful that they can't even make a decision. They need to bring the whole United Nations to make a decision for them. You know why? Because they end obeying the laws of the God. That's why they need no... They, they are the most powerful nations in the world. But they need the whole world to make a decision for them. Because they have gone away from the decision of Allah. What Allah decided for them. And then we start running behind the dunya. 
and we start looking at the materialistic things of the dunya, the power, the pump, the show. Wa mal hayat dunya illa laidu wa lahwa, says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the life of this world except but play and amusement? Or what is the life of this world except wealth and politics? That's the game. And you know, I always like my little bit of humor sometimes, and I like to look at the example. Look at the love. Look at these women. You know, at least I must tell you, we take good care of our women in Darululu, man. Our women have been elevated right now. They've gone to the auditorium. Normally, you have to pay to use that auditorium. They got it for free. They pray for free. They got two 50-inch television. Better air condition than here. Say, say, alhamdulillah, baraka. They are the elevated. Promoted. We get good to have our ladies here, alhamdulillah. The ladies carry a lot of barakats, you know. But they got to not spoil it. But look at the barakat of Hagar and Sarah. Got the blessings. Allah used them as an opportunity to get blessings. Great blessings. But you know, it reminds me about, and ladies got to be careful not to be opposite to Sarah and Hagar. It reminds me of this, this wife. Look at the kind of wife or wives they were to Abraham, alayhi salatu wasalam. They were ready to obey and follow, even though it meant one wife had no child, and the next wife had one child. Each one sacrificed their child or their non having a child, and Allah blessed them both with children and became the mothers of generations. You know, there's a, story, there's a joke about this wife. You know, how, how some women, opposite to Hagar and Sarah, are always critical and not supportive of their husbands. There was this man, this sheikh, he was a very, very pious man. And if you study some Sufism and history, people used to go into all kinds of Sufism. You know, you talk about Jesus walked on water. Peace be upon him. If you study some Islamic Sufism and history of saints, you will see that they walked on water. Yeah, a great interesting thing. So this pious man, every evening after Asr Salah, he used to go next door, behind the neighbor's house, and he used to sit and go into Murakaba and make dhikr and meditation, meditation, meditation. And in his meditation, he used to rise and start to fly. Maybe an Aladdin and Wonderful Lamb kind of story here. So <laughs> one day his wife got in an argument and said, look at you, you only pretend to be a good man. You should be like the neighbor's husband. Every day he's so pious that when he's sitting making dhikr, he just flies, he just rises, and he goes out into the atmosphere in the dhikr of Allah. You, you, you can't even reach that level. He said, you know, you don't realize it is me. Don't you realize I'm not home every evening at that time? I go behind the neighbor's house and do that, and then I start flying. She said, oh, that's why you're always flying crooked like if you all fall down. See, she had to find a reason to criticize him because he's a husband. What do you say in Urdu? Gar ke murge, dal barabar hai. There's a famous Urdu saying that home chicken is like dal. <laughs> That's the thing. And, and you know, there was another incident. You see, these wives of Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, our wives must, and women, and they must take that example. Of Ummul Mu'mineen, wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Interesting time, and I chose to mention this because of what is happening in the United Nations. Hajj coming around the corner, so I decided to use this story, inshallah. But there's another story of a sheikh and his wife, opposite to this two wives of Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam. One day, some students went to his home, and they knocked the door. The wife came out. What do you want? Who do you want? Who you came to talk to? And she started bawling loud, and you know, like how some women operate. If you call for the husband, they, they tell you in advance he's not home even though he's eating right there. Or they quarrel or do something. Or you, you hear so much quarrel that you refuse to ask to speak to the husband in advance. So they said, we came to meet the sheikh. We had a question. We had a question to ask. She said, no, no, he's busy right now. I can't talk to you. You know, no, typical thing you see all over the place. A couple days after the students met the sheikh, he said, sheikh, you're such a pious man. All the dhikr and Quran and ibadah. How come you have such a miserable wife? Quarrel so much and so miserable. We are so scared of her that we ain't coming back again to ask for you. How come you such a pious man and you got such a miserable woman? He said, that's why I'm so pious. Because I fear her so much, I'm always in Quran and Zikir. <laughs> so that's the good of her. He was such a pious man, he even gave her credit for being pious. 
He said, because of her being so miserable, he's always praying to Allah. Because she's always quarreling. But you see, Ibrahim salam, didn't have that problem. His wives were always willing. Look at the sacrifice. You would hardly find women nowadays making that. And in the history, today, if people understand that, love, and they didn't do it out of jealousy. Don't let people confuse us. It is a love. And if we look back at the history of the children of Ismail salam, and Isaac or Isaac, peace be upon him, you will see the progeny and the offsprings of Hagar and Sarah, the most powerful people today in the world, by the barakat of their sacrifice. And that's why I quoted that verse by Ibnillah, their tomorrow. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqullah wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat ligad. They were prepared to sacrifice their today to send forth for their tomorrow. Sarah sacrificed her love and her selfishness of wanting a husband for herself for the sake of Allah, which reaped her son who became the father of prophets. Hagar, peace be upon her, sacrificed her one son for the love of Allah, her tomorrow. When Allah commanded to sacrifice him and today the most powerful nation in the world. Look at that. The most powerful people. The sacrifice of these mothers. The pi- how they cooperated with the husband and the piety. So women, well, it's important to understand that. Fathers, don't miss that point. It was, or, or, it was the dealings of Ibrahim and his willingness to obey Allah. It's not that he stopped back and said, Oh no, dunya, I need more money. The one little son he had, he sacrificed. And you know the whole story. Allah didn't make him do the bloodshed and whatever. We'll talk about that sometime later on, inshallah. But he was willing to give it for the sake of Allah. Today, Allah may not want sons and daughters from us. But Allah wants to see our sacrifice. Today, our motor cars may be our Ishmael. Our family will be our Ishmael. Our business, our money, our position, our authority, or whatever could be our Ishmael. We have to know how to not to let this love for this dunya because, and one of the reasons why that example is dear for us, because people loved children and the sons were the wealth of fathers and mothers. So because of that, so today when we love things in this dunya, be prepared to devote that time and that money and that life and that effort for Allah, inshallah. And I know last week I promised I would share something with you and again the time has gone against me, I can't share it, maybe in the next khutbah. I really want to share this aspect on this point, what I heard after 9-11 where this preacher got up publicly on television on the 10 years anniversary a few weeks ago and said that Muhammad of Islam, and Auzi Billah, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said 9-11 is a result of the Prophet of Islam, the people are following what he taught them and commanded them to do. And that hurts me and bleeds my heart to know that a lot of our Muslims, we sleep, we don't care to spend our money, we don't care to, a lot of people, not everybody, a lot of people don't care to spend their money, spend their time. Some people believe, okay, we're going to get a few lawyers and sue him. That doesn't solve the problem. Because you've got a million people who say the next thing. We need, if they say these things in the media, and I was telling you, it's a preacher from right in Miami here. Accused the Prophet Wasallam directly and said, 9-11 is a result of terrorists who obeyed the teachings of their Prophet. And I wouldn't want to quote name on the public here. Today we sleep... We don't spend our money, we don't spend our time. A lot of people don't have the, not all of us, some people. There are people who are very devoted, and Allah bless you. But those of us who sleep are not prepared to spend, as Ibrahim Salam and his wife spend their time and their love for Allah. We, I keep on saying we need to propagate. That's why we started the show called Interfaith Views and Issues on Al-Hikmah TV. Last week I had an interfaith president, and I'm trying to get a lot of rabbis and priests on that show. I really want you to support that show. Whatever you could contribute towards that show on Al Hikmah TV. Because we get in rabbis and priests and ministers and pastors to come and counteract those radical statements that other preachers and pastors make. You see, I tell him it doesn't solve the problem. But when I get another rabbi and another priest to say, well, what he said is wrong, that preacher probably didn't read the scriptures, that makes some more sense than I saying it. And that's what we're doing on this show. And we are working right now to get a local television show so we could do a lot of this interfaith program. Because a lot of us lost into this world, we're concerned about money and dunya, and people getting up, ridiculing the Quran, Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad, and we just sleep. We just come Juma, we go, we eat. 
It is haram to sit and allow Allah and his Rasul to be ridiculed. All of you know that. We need to do something about it. I'm not saying to fight. I'm not saying to use guns and bombs and swords. I'm saying let's use knowledge. Use the media. Use the intellectual system of today to educate those people so that at least Allah on the Day of Judgment will say we use our money, we use our knowledge, we use our time to spread the message of Islam to counteract these situations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, ya Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Allah. We thank thee for all the favors and bounties you have bestowed upon us, ya Allah. We ask thee, ya Allah, to send your peace and blessings unto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We ask thee, Allah, to forgive us and guide us and grant us Jannah without reckoning, inshallah. Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina Allah banad bi rahmatika ya arham rahmin inna Allah malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala sayyidina maulana muhammad wa ala ali muhammadin bi adadi man sallallahu wa sallam Allahumma salli ala sayyidina maulana muhammad wa ala ali muhammadin bi adadi man qa'ada wa qam wa salli ala jameel anbiyai wal mursaleen wa ala kulli malaikatika al maqarrabin wa ala ibadillahi salihin bi rahmatika ya arham rahimin ibadallah inna Allah ya'amalu wal adli wal ihsan wa ita idhi al qurba wa yanha anil fahsha wal munkari wal bagh i'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon wa la dhikrullahi ta'ala a'ala wa awla wa azza wa jalla wa hamu wa akbar Allahu akbar akim as مدینے کے دن رات اللہ اکبر مدینے کی کیا بات اللہ اکبر مدینے کے دن رات اللہ اکبر مدینے کی کیا بات اللہ اکبر مدینے کے دن رات اللہ اکبر مدینے کی کیا بات اللہ اکبر مدینے کے دن رات اللہ اکبر مدینے کی کیا بات اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر ازانوں کے لمحات اللہ اکبر نمازوں کے اوقات اللہ اکبر ازانوں کے لمحات اللہ اکبر نمازوں کے اوقات اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر یہ قبر النبی اور یہ محراب و ممبر یہ قبر النبی اور یہ محراب و ممبر مقدس مقامات اللہ اکبر مقدس مقامات اللہ اکبر یہ قبر النبی اور یہ محراب و ممبر یہ قبر النبی اور یہ محراب و ممبر مقدس مقامات اللہ اکبر مقدس مقامات اللہ اکبر مواجہ مبارک سلاموں کی بارش مواجہ مبارک سلاموں کی بارش درودوں کی سوغات اللہ اکمہ